Good afternoon. I'm Jack Lavin, President and CEO of the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to day two of the exchange. As you saw yesterday, or if you are just joining us today, we have reimagined the exchange with a keynote presentation, breakout sessions, and plenty of time for networking and visiting our tremendous group of exhibitors through our technology platform that allows you to connect with other attendees and chamber members in real time. We had a terrific day one of the exchange, filled with a lot of connections through the one-on-one -on -one video calling, speed networking, group discussions, exhibitor booths, chats, and more. We are optimistic that day two will be just as fulfilling for you. All of this would not have been possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Our presenting sponsor, Camelot, networking reception sponsor, DoorDash, technology sponsor, Effective, Supporting sponsor, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses, panel discussion host sponsors, Fresco Labs, Kintone, and Novir, Network, networking lounge sponsor, GCG. Thank you sponsors for your support of the exchange. While nothing can replace meeting with colleagues and customers face-to-face, -face, you have made it possible to keep the core elements of the exchange that matter most. Developing new connections and growing our businesses are pieces to the puzzle that will allow Chicagoland businesses to recover after COVID and prosper far into the future. It is now my great honor to introduce our next speaker, ComEd CEO, Joe Dominguez, for the plenary keynote, Chicagoland's Clean and Equitable Energy Future. Joe leads ComEd, an Exelon company, which powers the lives of more than 4 million residential and business customers, or 70% of Illinois' population. He is responsible for the safe, affordable, and reliable delivery of electricity to customers and for empowering them to manage their energy use. He oversees the electric grid for Chicago and most of Northern Illinois in ComEd's partnership with the diverse communities it serves. He is also the 2021 chairperson of the Illinois Utilities Business Diversity Council. Joe is also deeply engaged in the community through civic activities. He serves on several boards of directors and councils, including United Way of Metro Chicago, Lyric Opera of Chicago, Hispanics in Energy, and Rutgers Law School Corporate Governance Advisory Board. He co-founded the Association of Latino Energy and Environmental Professionals, an organization focused on ensuring the Latino voice is heard in the energy and environmental industries. As we continue to grapple with the global and local impacts of climate change, the pandemic and increased demand for clean and resilient power, the ways we produce, deliver, and consume energy must continue to adapt to these changing realities. With the impacts of COVID deepening longstanding disparities related to air quality, public health, and economic opportunity in underserved communities in our region, it is even more critical to ensure that energy transition is clean, resilient, and equitable for all families and businesses. Energy must remain reliable and affordable, and that's exactly what Joe and the entire ComEd team are working to achieve. I want to thank Joe for being with us today to talk about this important topic of clean and equitable energy. I have known Joe for over 15 years. He is a true champion of the business community. Chicagoland has some of the lowest cost and most reliable power in the country. It is a competitive advantage for us in an environment where costs are rising for business and global competition is ever increasing. I am confident Joe's leadership will continue these competitive advantages and lead us into a clean and equitable energy future. I am excited to hear his presentation today. Please join me in welcoming to the main stage, my friend, the CEO of ComEd, Joe Dominguez. Jack, thank you so much for that uh, warm introduction. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of ComEd to give this keynote address on issues I think that concern all of us, how we get to a clean, resilient, reliable future with affordable electricity prices as we try to tackle things like climate change and this massive transformation that we're beginning to see in the transportation sector to electric vehicles. But before I get into it, and, uh, and folks, I'm going to do a little bit. I'm, I'm an engineer at heart here, and so I'm going to get into this from a, from a technical standpoint in a second. 
But before I do that, Jack, I just want to thank you for your leadership and the Chamber's leadership on the COVID response task force. I know it was an invaluable exercise for Chicago businesses, and it was for us here at ComEd. Uh, we have been, uh, we've had a remote workforce of about 45% of the population of ComEd since the pandemic began, and that's going to continue, I think, for the foreseeable future. But 55% of our women and men are still out in the field and have been since the beginning of the pandemic because we recognized that keeping the power flowing uh, was more important now, frankly, than ever. And when we take a look at the events last week in, in Texas, the terrible events that happened there where millions of families were without power in the middle of uh, extreme weather, uh, we know how important it is to power Chicago and the surrounding region with reliable and affordable power. And I'm so pleased to have been able to do that. I'm really proud of the team here. You know, last year at ComEd was our best year ever in terms of reliability performance in over 100 years of history. It also happened to be a year where we saw some of the worst weather we've ever seen in our 100 year history with massive flooding that uh, took out Lower Wacker and and flooded most of the city. And of course, a derecho storm in August, uh, which was clearly one for the record books. We had 15 tornadoes land in the Comet service territory that day and, and hurricane force winds really affecting the entirety of the service territory. And despite that, we came out of the year leading the nation, leading all utilities in the nation in terms of reliable performance against two metrics that we use the number of outages we have and the duration of those outages. And uh, I'm, I'm so proud uh, with everything that went on last year that this team here fought through those distractions and continued to serve all of our customers, all the families and businesses that depend on us. And I hope you too are proud of us. Um, as I dig into the, uh, to the subject at hand, uh, the events in Texas uh, are very much on my mind. And I don't think there's any way to understate the significance of the fact that in the last nine months, uh, we have seen what could only be described as catastrophic grid failures in both California and Texas, our two most populated states, uh, home to over 70 million Americans. Um, and we saw those events occur uh, contemporaneous with extreme weather that both of those states uh, had never seen really before historically. And out of that comes a narrative that um, I think is really twofold. One is that we're moving too fast in our transformation to clean energy. And uh, number two, that uh, renewable energy in particular is the uh, cause of the failures of the grid in those states. And I, I actually beg to differ uh, with both of those uh, statements. First, with regard to renewable energy, I think the, the reality of Texas, and we'll see this as more investigations unfold, is that all generation sources in Texas were relatively unprepared for the historically bad weather and the cold that we saw there. And that was the result uh, of uh, failure to winterize uh, pieces of equipment because it wasn't expected that pieces of equipment in Southern Texas, for example, would have to operate in seven degree Fahrenheit weather. Uh, I don't believe that uh, renewables were the cause of the event, but at the same time, for those who accurately say, look, how are we going to run a grid on power resources that are inherently intermittent, only operate when the wind is blowing and the sun is out? I think those are fair questions, but that's not what Texas was about. In terms of whether we're moving too fast, I, I guess my response to that is we're not really moving fast enough. Whether you believe that the events in California and Texas are the result of climate change, and there's a debate uh, in, in the uh, world scientific community as to whether specific events like that can be attributed to climate change. What we do know is this, that extreme weather events like the things we saw in Texas, like the things we saw in California, and frankly have seen for a number of years, are the types of events we could see with increasing frequency across the globe. And frankly, we don't have to go to California or even to Texas to see that. As I, as I started out talking about the events just last year in Chicago uh, and the surrounding area give us a, a clear indication that we are looking at weather patterns that are different and more intense 
than anything we've uh, dealt with before. And so as we design the grid, we need to be mindful of the investments necessary to continue to make it more resilient. Because what we've seen is dozens of lives lost and tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars of economic damage as a result of the failure of the grid in these circumstances. What I'd like to do today is explore with you the combination of resources that we at ComEd think could power the grid going forward. And I also want to talk about the electric vehicle transformation that's occurring. Uh, it's happening faster, I think, than any of us intend intended. Uh, many of you may have seen a statement from General Motors that they're not going to provide vehicles that uh, have internal combustion engines after 2035. Shortly thereafter, Ford announced a $30 billion investment in electric vehicles. Range Rover, Jaguar, others have had an even shorter time frame to transition to electric vehicles. And certainly we are doing that here at ComEd with a transition of 50% of our fleet by 2025. So that's coming faster. And I think it's uh, appropriate for folks to say, hey, it, aren't these covariant risks? In other words, if we have a risk to the grid from climate change, why would we invent new uses of the grid and electrify the transportation sector? Um, doesn't that create an overall society societal risk that's greater than if we'd use diverse fuels? And I think there's some elements of truth to that. But one of the things that I think you're going to find interesting in this presentation is that some of those risks are negatively covariant. In other words, actually electrifying the transportation sector can provide us with some infrastructure that makes the transition to renewable energy more feasible from an en engineering standpoint and from a reliability standpoint. So I'm going to um, ask Matt to project up a slide and I'll explain what this is. On the left hand side of the slide is um, a regular week for April uh, in the ComEd zone. The black line represents the amount of power that our customers are using. And you can see in the x-axis, we've got a Sunday through Saturday view of this. And we're using about 10 gigawatts of power, which relatively speaking for this 13 state region we're in is about three times larger than Philadelphia, which is our, our next largest city. And so uh, on the right hand side, what you see is that same customer base, ComEd customers, and what we're showing here is power usage Sunday through Saturday for a sample week in July. And as you can see there, not surprisingly, and you see this in your own electric bills, we use a lot more power in July for our customers than we do in what we call a shoulder week in April or the same sorts of weeks in October and November where you see moderate temperatures and you don't really have the air conditioning load. The other thing you see in the July week, again, on the right hand side of this slide, is that um, you see a great deal of fluctuation during the course of the day. And again, that's daytime air conditioning load, as well as some industrial customers who have day shifts that don't operate at night. But whereas we use about uh, 10,000 megawatts of power in April, uh, that could go up to as much as 20 or 22 or 23 thousand megawatts, uh, depending on how hot the week is in July. And so what I'd like to do now is just layer in for you so you can see where we're getting our sources of power, because there's a great question. Well, where are we today? You know, if if President Biden is talking about getting to 100 percent clean energy uh, by 2035 and uh, Governor Pritzker also has had policy objectives here, not only meet the Paris Accords, but similarly power the grid with clean and renewable energy. Where exactly are we at ComEd today? So let me show you where we're getting our power today. I'm sorry, Matt, are the slides advancing for you? Yeah, I'm trying that, my screen. My screen froze up here, so. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So, um, sorry about that, folks. Uh, um, I, as much of an engineer as I am, I don't have uh, complete control of my laptop just yet. Uh, all right. So, let me just tell you what I'm showing you here. So, 
Um, the blue that's represented under that black line is the amount of nuclear energy that we have in the state. And you can see that in the April week, it was about 95 or 9,000 megawatts of our energy was coming from nuclear. In the summertime, it was 10,000. It just so happened during the week that we took a look at in April, there was one of the plants that was having a refueling outage. But that blue is pretty much a constant amount of energy that is produced by those plants every single day of the year. And they were designed to meet ComEd load. And they're what we call base load. In other words, they're the amount of energy that we generally use 24-7, 365 days a year, regardless of the time of year. So right away, you can see that nuclear is a tremendous amount of our power at ComEd. It represents uh, over 70% of the energy that is delivered to us and well over 90% of the clean energy that is uh, delivered to us. There's a little bit of what I call other here, which is some fossil generation, mostly gas and coal plants that are operating at all times to maintain some power quality characteristics. Not much more to say about that. As I could layer in here, the uh, wind uh, generation. And so a couple things I wanna show, with, uh, show you here is the wind generation fluctuates uh, as wind comes across our service territory. On the left-hand side, again, your April week, you see the green for existing wind generation. We spend a little bit over $200 million a year on renewables, and most of that is being spent or has been spent historically on wind generation. You see it performs extraordinarily well in April, and it does likewise perform very well for us in October, November, and often in the winter as well. It falls off during the hot, still days of the summer. And you can see that on the July chart here, where the same wind generation that was producing a lot of output in April is at certain times not producing any output in July. And uh, during the hottest week of last summer, as an example, we lost well over 95% of the wind generation. And during the coldest week, where we have these so-called blocking events, where high pressure systems sit over our region, whether it's hot or cold, we don't get the transition in weather, which brings the wind, and we tend not to have uh, a lot of the wind resource. And so you could, you could see that we had maximum output uh, of uh, 2,600 megawatts. So wind looks like a nuclear plant or a dual unit site in April, and it doesn't look like uh, that same sort of performance in July. So what you see here is where we're producing emissions on this, on this voyage to get to zero emissions energy, really where we need to have uh, energy sources is in July. All of this white area under the black curve is where we don't presently have uh, zero emission uh, generation, whether it's wind, solar, or nuclear at work. And as we procure in the future, we need to focus on resources that are gonna operate in July and August, particularly during those daytime periods. What does that look like? That looks, of course, like solar energy. So one of the things we welcome in the ComEd zone is the development of solar energy resources because they really coincide with where we need some additional uh, energy. In terms of where we are relative to everyone else in the nation, I think it's a really great story for Chicago land businesses as you attract uh, talent and, uh, and you talk to your customers. Uh, today, ComEd uh, has zero emission sources that provide 92% of our hourly energy. So if we look at all 8,760 hours of a year of the year, 92% of those hours are covered by zero emission energy. By contrast, California, which is often thought of as a clean energy leader, is at 46%. Hawaii, uh, which again, people tend to think of because of the amount of solar there, as a clean energy leader is only 28%. And Ameren uh, down in Southern Illinois is ahead of most, but only uh, less than half of the way where ComEd is. And so one of the things that this illustrates for us is as we as a state try to get to 100% clean energy, one of the challenges is going to be to take the Ameren zone, which has been well behind the ComEd zone and focus a lot of the development in that area, and I think there's great opportunity. At the same time, take the ComEd zone, our customers, and tweak the resource mix 
so that we have more solar in it. So what I'd like to do next is take you uh, on, a, on, a, on a fast forward here to 2030 and take a look at what our generation mix will look like in 2030, and then layer on a couple of the legislative proposals that are uh, in, front of, uh, in front of policymakers in Springfield right now and explain what they do. So I showed you in the earlier chart, uh, April week and a July week. Here, I'm gonna show you April as measured against these two legislative proposals, one by the Clean Energy Jobs Coalition, that is a coalition of environmental interests, and another by the Path to 100, which is a coalition principally made up of wind and solar energy companies that wanna expand uh, their market share here in Illinois. And so the, the, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna build up the existing resource mix. There's your nuclear. And that accounts folks for the fact that by 2030, a couple of our dual unit sites are going to be reaching their license life. So unless they're extended, we're not gonna have those resources anymore. Again, some fossil resources for grid stability. Won't talk more about them. And there's your wind resources. And the reason I wanna take a look at April is this. Most people, and I certainly understand that after, after what you saw in Texas, most people are concerned with blackouts, not having enough power when we need it, which would be a focus on July and August and our other uh, peak times of the year in the winter. But what I really wanna explore here, because it relates to the transformation of the transportation sector that I'm gonna to speak to in a moment, is where we have more energy than we need. In uh, Europe, those events are called blowouts, not blackouts, but blow blowouts, because you have more wind generation than you have consumption. And for us in the power sector, that is as problematic as having not enough energy. And the reason for that is our grid is set up to handle the transfer of a certain amount of energy. And if you exceed the transfer capabilities of the grid, what you'd end up doing is burning out the components. You'd literally uh, blow out transformers and major uh, types of equipment on our trans, uh, transmission uh, network. So we have about the ability today, for example, to export about 6,000 megawatts of power, more like 5,500 megawatts of power. So when we're above that, we exceed the transmission limits and we have to literally curtail the energy resources or we have to build more and expensive transmission lines to the east to exp export our excess power. So let me show you what happens with these two legislative proposals. That's the amount of extra wind uh, that these proposals would uh, recommend. And again, um, the proposals don't do what we think they need to do at ComEd, which is focus more on solar than on wind. So we get a whole bunch more wind in April. The path to 100 targets are slightly less aggressive than the Clean Jobs Coalition targets on the left. And that's why you see the differences there. And this is the amount of solar. The, uh, the red is utility scale solar, which is good for us. Again, if I were to look at the July charts, that's where that resource is showing up and it needs to. And then the dotted line below the black line is what we would think of as rooftop solar. A lot of the solar businesses are installing today. So what you see here in these two legislative proposals is we would have not only more energy than uh, we need, uh, but frankly, uh, more energy than our system could handle. And so that's 17 gigawatts of power, 17,000 megawatts of excess power we would see built out under the Clean Energy Jobs Act proposal would result in us having to spend many billions of dollars on transmission lines to move these, this power to the east to states that frankly don't want it because they want to build their own renewable energy industry there. So we have an excess power problem. The result would be we'd have to curtail these resources, feather the wind blades, stop the inverters on solar panels, bring down the nuclear plants. And that's not a great economic outcome for our customers. Why? Because unlike fossil fuel plants, renewable energy resources, the entire cost of them is in building them. It's not the fuel, the fuel is obviously free. The wind and the sun are free, but it's the cost of building the facility that accounts for the cost 
of energy from these devices. Stated differently, once you build them, you want to use them. In the old days, we would have looked at this problem and we would have said, you know what, it's crazy to build this much renewable generation. It's going to be a major problem. It's going to result in big time transmission headaches and transmission expenses. And as a consequence, we would have pushed against it. Now, we'd like to tailor this, right? Again, we'd like to talk to the folks that are doing this and really focus on building resources that operate uh, more coincidentally, I should say, with our uh, energy demand. But the other dimension we started to look at is this other issue of the transformation of the transportation sector. And the question is, if clean energy is a good thing, can we really have too much of a good thing? This slide would tell you maybe, but it's only that because we're not thinking more comprehensively about how we use this clean energy economy to transform other sectors, business, industry, transportation. And when you start thinking about the load that is going to come from electric vehicles, can we put this clean energy advantage, this amount of energy we'd throw away if we simply curtailed the units, to good use in powering this transformation to cleaner air? And here's how we started to look at it. The American uh, Heart Association, the American Lung Association, and the Respiratory Health Association all have linked healthcare costs and deaths and illnesses to local pollution. So this is a little different than thinking about the world from a greenhouse gas or a climate change perspective. This is a focus, a hyper-focus really, on localized air pollution. And unfortunately, for the many virtues that our region has, one of the things that isn't so great is the amount of traffic congestion we have. We have traffic congestion here that is um, only less really than New York and Los Angeles in terms of its intensity. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to us that when we think about air quality impacts associated with car emissions, diesel buses and truck emissions, that Chicago is one of the worst areas in the country. And if you've looked at what EPA has done in this space, it's always Chicago in the middle part of the country that is last to come out of some of the most um, non-attainment or, or highest pollutant areas of the nation. And if you look at that, if you break that down, you really start to see that from a neighborhood to neighborhood perspective. And the Respiratory Health Association has done a lot of great work at looking at the bus routes, as an example, in Chicago and measuring asthma and other health illnesses uh, near those bus routes. And obviously, the buses are emitting uh, a lot of pollution. And so what we started to look at is some work that was done on uh, life expectancy differences uh, by a number of different uh, academic uh, groups. And you may have heard this before, but we have in this uh, state some of the greatest life expectancy differences, as much as 26 years in life expectancy differences in neighborhoods that are just six, six miles or so apart. It's really pretty incredible. And we started to overlay life expectancy differences for these different regions of Chicago. And that's what the numbers are. They're the, the underlying life expectancy in these different neighborhoods. And we were taking a look at air quality and the darker colors here are worse air quality. And unsurprisingly, what we've found is when you take the top zip codes for lowest life expectancy, they correlate fairly tightly to those zip codes that also have some of the worst air quality in the nation. And then if you take another look at that and you say, well, let's take a look at COVID deaths, then surprisingly, those COVID deaths occur in those areas. And I say surprisingly, because they're low life expectancy. So we have a lower percentage of older people. We know COVID has a greater impact on older folks. And yet it's in some of our younger neighborhoods where we have some of the highest percentages of COVID deaths. And we'd submit to you that that's because air quality has undermined health in those neighborhoods to a degree where there's a great susceptibility to COVID and uh, other morbidities. So. We, uh, we have matched this up, and what we started to take a look at is 
can we use the excess energy that we're producing at ComEd as we build out renewables and we power this transformation? What we found is this, that as we, if we could get to about 2 million vehicles by 2030 in Northern Illinois and tie this to a growth of renewables, what the 2 million electric vehicles in Northern Illinois will do is shave off some of the excess generation problems that we have in the grid during the shoulder months. It will actually save us about $2 billion in grid expenses by using energy that otherwise would have no home. And at the same time, we could reduce healthcare costs by something like $6 billion a year. And it's, it's a really stunning impact. And the way we calculate that is the American Lung Association has correlated the consumption of gasoline to healthcare costs. And what they found is for every gallon of gas that you burn uh, in an internal combustion engine or diesel, you create something on the order of 74 cents of adjacent healthcare costs. The results of those emissions on uh, their surrounding population. So as we create an avenue to electrify 2 million vehicles on what is otherwise excess free energy, we could substantially reduce the healthcare costs. So as we think about these problems and in closing today, we think that we could get close to 100% clean energy. We still need to deal with the bumpiness of some of these renewables, but we're confident that through grid investment, we could move the power around efficiently. And through battery storage, we're going to be able to address some of the day night excess generation issues. And eventually through the use of hydrogen, where we would uh, create hydrogen in the shoulder months and burn that as a fuel in, 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 um, in power generators and power plants during the summer we think we could get in the ComEd zone to very close to 100% clean energy by 2035. And we could use free energy to actually reduce our grid integration costs by billions of dollars and power transformation in the vehicle sector. Now, all of this depends on us making the investments that are needed to keep the grid reliable in the face of extreme weather. So I close by circling back to where we, we started from. 10 years ago, we started with an investment platform at ComEd that was needed to address gaps in reliability performance. I told you that ComEd today is the most reliable utility in America. We believe it's best in class. That wasn't the story 10 years ago, but we've made the right investments in poles and underground cable. And I hope you have seen the results of those investments on your own reliability. And because of falling energy prices as a result of natural gas and renewables and our nuclear fleet, as well as our effective deployment of energy efficiency tools, we've been able to keep our monthly bills lower than they were 10 years ago, nominal, not adjusted for inflation, but nominally. So today I think we can boast three things at ComEd, being the most reliable utility in America, being the most or one of the most affordable utilities in America, and being the utility in America that is 92% clean today. We have a lot of great advantages and we could do a lot more good things. It begins with the new energy policies that I believe are gonna emerge out of the discussions that are occurring in Springfield today. We look forward to your participation. And I thank you for, on behalf of all of the ComEd employees for the privilege to serve all of your businesses and family. We look forward to doing it uh, in the future and doing it even better than we've done last year during our record setting year. So thank you very much. Jack, again, thank you so much for having me on the program. Thank you, Joe, for taking the time to be with us today for day two of the exchange and sharing the large scale changes needed to expand new clean technologies while ensuring that energy remains reliable and affordable. With your leadership and ComEd, Chicago is poised to be a leader in a clean energy future. Like you and ComEd, the Chamber understands the importance of clean energy 
and we will continue to champion this to help ensure that the energy transition is clean, resilient, and equitable for all businesses and Chicagoans. It is the right thing to do and holds many new business opportunities. I also want to thank Joe. He was one of the co-chairs of our Economic Recovery Task Force for the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. Thank you again, Joe, for your leadership in the Chicagoland business community. The exchange has historically been a place to exchange business cards, secure leads, and grow business. Albeit virtual, this year is no different. We know you are making connections and you're just a few clicks away from your next big deal. I encourage you to visit our exhibitors that are with us today, learn more about their offerings and capabilities, and find the solutions for your business needs and grow your network by making connections in the one-to-one -one networking area. Our technology platform makes it easy to connect. And like yesterday, we're giving away a pair of round trip tickets again today, courtesy of Southwest Airlines. You'll hear how you can win these in just a moment. Also, please take advantage of the breakout sessions at three o'clock with topics and information ranging from developing marketing in 2021 to managing workflows. And join us for the celebratory networking reception and happy hour at four o'clock. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you again for being with us today and your support of the Chamber. Enjoy the rest of the exchange. Thank you, Jack. Welcome to day two of the exchange. Just like yesterday, we are giving out two round trip Southwest Airline tickets as an incentive to take advantage of all the opportunities offered at this year's exchange to network. The Chamber is going to award the individual with the greatest number of connections at the end of the day with two Southwest Airline tickets. A connection means that you and another person have accepted an invitation to connect. A request must be mutual and accepted by both parties. Take advantage of this networking opportunity to make meaningful connections and to promote your business and possibly win two round trip tickets. The winner will be announced at the end of the day. Enjoy the exchange reimagined.